All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fantastic episode of My Orgasmic Life. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, gonna, here we are. We're going to have a good time today. We are going to have a very good time. And I have a fantastic, I'm so excited about my conversation with my co-host, which I'll let him introduce himself in a moment. Um, but we're going to talk about conscious cock. What the hell is a conscious cock? And by the way, we are not talking about roosters. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> All right, Christopher, who are you? And uh, what, do you, what do you want to tell the world about you? Well, I'm a Well, sex first of all, let's start, let's start with your name. Yeah, Christopher Lovestone. That's Christopher with a K. Thank you very much. And... Um, I'm a sex and relationship coach. I mostly work with men and couples in heterosexual relationships to really help them overcome the relationship challenges that plague our society so they can actually get what they really want out of their relationship. Because so many men that I know are really good human beings inside, but they're feeling paralyzed, uh, especially post Me Too. They don't want to do any more harm. They're kind of aware of the scope of the problem of oppression and abuse of women and harassment and the prevalence of all these, these things. And they don't want to perpetuate that, but they don't know what to do. So they're kind of keeping their sexuality in a box mm -hmm. for fear of doing something wrong or being labeled a bad guy or a misogynist. Um, so what I do is I teach emotional intelligence and self-awareness and communication tools, as well as modern sex education from a perspective that, I want men to embrace their sexuality and give them tools to help uh, create a relationship where it can, it can blossom, you know, so they get what they really want sexually and they're really getting their needs met rather than, you know, living a life of, of the dutiful husband or the dutiful partner, um, which is inauthentic. You know, they're playing a false role that maybe was handed to them by their parents or movies from Hollywood. Um, so really it's about self-liberation but it's, you could also say it's sex positive, uh, male self-empowerment. There's lots of different ways to look at it, but it's taking our sexuality and looking at it from a positive light rather than thinking of it as something negative that should be shamed and kept in a box and then sat on and squished. So um, I've written a book called Conscious Cock, which was the entire impetus for this interview with you today. And I'm excited to talk, talk about that. And it's all about flipping the script. You know, we think about dick and cock as cuss words. They're derogatory, you know, and that's really sad because when you think about it, we don't have any terms of endearment for the genitals in the English language. Now, you might not have ever thought about that before, but we only have medical clinical terms, phallus or penis or vagina, uterus. You know, we don't, or we have slang. Oh, she's such a cunt. Oh, he's just a dick. And we don't even think about it. But what we're doing is we're shaming our sexuality every time we use one of these words to be derogatory to somebody. Um, yes. So I want to reclaim that. And I want us to have positive words. Now, in Sanskrit from India, you know, the, the, the language of yoga these days, um, there are a couple words that are infiltrating into the English language, like yoni and lingam, lingam yep. or vajra, which are literally terms of adoration. Yep. They're, they're, they're words, sacred words, like uh, yoni means tunnel of light or the divine passage. And uh, lingam means um, wand of light. Or it basically means the, the cock of God. Okay, and all life comes from the penis. Life can't exist without it. It literally is sacred or required for life so why shame it so anyway conscious cock is about taking that derogatory term cock and let's redefine that let's talk about a rooster all right if you ever yeah. grew up on a farm or around a farm i know you're super excited but remember we're going on an adventure together yes. <laughs> so let's let's have a conversation together about this all right yeah. <laughs> okay so um, 
when I say, and I love that you just, you're just so exuberant and you're like so excited, which is part of why I was like, Hey, come play with me on the show. Cause you're going to like, cheers. Let's get play. all excited. Right. So for me, I love the word cock. That is actually of all of my sex words. Cock is my favorite one. And it's like this, the, for me, it means this worshiping of the strength that goes mm. along with that. And mm. I know that for a lot of women in particular, the two hard C words, cunt and cock, are the ones that are like, ah! Oh, they're so charged. They're so, so repugnant, right? So that, like, you can't so say that. No, right? no. It's just dirty. And it's... Uh, and the dirtiness, let's, let's, let's embrace the word dirty, because I love embracing the fact that dirty is not bad. Dirty is sexy. It's like the idea of the visualization of rolling around in like mud is a sensual, sexy experience. If we can drop into some of those, reclaiming some of those words from this place of, how do I want to say it? Instead of being like, oh, that's a bad word and we're not supposed to use it and we need to come up with a sacred word, which I love the sacred words. They're super important and they're super, they're super powerful. Yoni, lingam, all of those amazing, you know, your honey pot and leaning tower of power and Ooh, all these I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, but all average everyday use terms that aren't derogatory and aren't necessarily sacred Ooh, either yeah. you know just like it's okay to just have a word to use you know have a word to use and i think also too to to like those words and find and and take the charge from the shame part of it to the empowerment and the sexiness and the rawness of it you know because i think that's part of the we have such a disconnect between sacred sexuality and the primal sexuality and, and it's like a great way to bridge that, that gap, that the word, I love how you combine those two words, conscious cock. It's like right. sacred and primal. Well, uh, well, I will distinguish from sacred. I'm not saying sacred cock. I'm saying conscious. And, and the simple way to, to consider that is to think about the reverse, the flip side of that, being unconscious. And I see m most people walking around like robots totally unconscious. They're just playing out patterns that they've learned to play out. They're just on autopilot. That's unconscious. So I'm not going the sacred route of Tantra. I'm not going the sacred route of saying you have to have a ceremony in order for sex to be this deeply fulfilling. But I am saying we have to wake up. We have to think. We have to analyze our, our preconceptions and look for our blind spots. That to me is consciousness. All right. So, so what would a conscious cock look like? Okay, I spent a long time thinking about that. And it was a really rich period for me. And it took a few years. How can I represent this concept? How? Literally. And, you know, memes are so powerful. Everybody loves a meme. They have thumbs it up and share it to their friends. Um, and I thought about it. What, what, how can I convey this conscious masculinity, the, the positive benefits of healthy, balanced masculinity? And to me, that image of a rooster comes to mind. Okay, because they're so powerful. They're this tiny little thing, but man, their energy is, fills the room. I mean, their crow crosses the valley. You'll, you'll hear it a mile away. And that's just this little tiny cocky bird. You know, the tail feathers and the, the crown. I mean, they really have a powerful, powerful energy. And it's a, you could look at it as an archetype. Mm -hmm. All right. They're, and they've got sharp spurs and they fight and they will attack to the death. They are, you know, even though they're small by our standards, but that image of confidence and kind of taking care of his flock, his family, his tribe, they're really, you know, bold and out there and protective. I like that, but <laughs> let's make it conscious. Let's exactly. put it under the microscope. Let's look for our blind spots. Let's look for the patterns that were programmed into us when we didn't know we were recording a pattern. And let's choose better pathways, better tools to use, better systems to incorporate in our life. So honestly, the image of a meditating rooster, a rooster sitting with his legs crossed, his feet on his hands. Now, I'm just going to show you. Okay, so this is the first draft of my book. 
And here is a little statue that I found from China where the image of a rooster is a powerful image and yeah. much, much more commonly used. So this guy is sitting with his knees crossed, meditating. I love it. I so love it embodies it. this concept of the positive, powerful aspects of masculinity, but with razor sharp, intentional focus, mm -hmm. not used un unconsciously. Okay. So what would you say? I love that image. What would you say is unconscious cock? What would what is our, the unconscious what, what is the unconscious cock look like? Like like any dominating man who isn't aware of and sensitive to caring for the people that he's hurting, right? Like any, anybody who is unconsciously perpetuating suppressive patterns in life, hurting the people around him, not listening, somebody who talks all the time and never lets anybody get a word in, somebody who's always right. You know, the, the normal word that we use for this is dick. Oh, he's just a dick. And that really just captures the essence, the energy of it, but I hate using derogatory words or using words for our genitalia as derogatory words, but you can think of uh, somebody from a CEO from a huge corporation who just doesn't give a care for anybody underneath him is just kind of raping society, raping every relationship that, that he has. Um, so anybody who really is perpetuating patterns of abuse, even if it's just verbal aggression mm -hmm. um, or uh, emotional superiority, um, you know, we can say is an unconscious cock is you know, somebody who's using masculinity for all the benefits that it pays them without actually sharing, um, rising in the world with other people without creating a level playing field with those around him. Mm -hmm. I love it. So what would be in the middle? Cause I think, I think that there's, there are on a societal level in particular in the North American culture, I think that there, you can see that very clear, overbearing, dominant, disrespectful, masculine energy. And then you see the, you know, conscious masculinity where you're like leaning into things and you're looking at things and you're, you're being aware of what's going on around you. But I think there's a higher percentage that are stuck kind of in between and doesn't really know what that looks like. Yeah, that, right. Right. Like it's 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 like it's not on a need because even the dominant, even that extreme dominance, there's some consciousness awareness in the choice of being an asshole <laughs> around you. <right? laughs> you think so? Okay, that's right? funny to put it that way. Right. So I think there's some conscious choice in that. Right. It's it's like I it it serves me. There's benefits to it. I, you know, choosing to manipulate others around me, like there's some, there's awareness that happens there. There's some consciousness awareness going on in that to make, to make that happen, to make that are your reality. So let's talk about the, the guys who are walking around in between the ones who are really just, they're just going on autopilot and they're just moving through the world and they don't really know what they're doing or how they're doing it and how it's affecting them and affecting everybody around them. Yeah, right. You know, there's two common terms that come to, to mind for this. There's nice guys, and I'll put that in air quotes, nice guys. But there's also, air quotes, good guys. And there's a distinction between the two that um, I've been really geeking out on recently. What's the difference between a nice guy and a good guy? Well, it's, kind of, it's an important distinction. It's kind of like there's this concept that I've been teaching in some of my workshops about finding the sweet spot between being a doormat and having people wipe their feet, feet on you all day long and being a jerk, right? Where's that sweet spot in there where you're not getting your, people aren't just wiping their feet on you all day, but you're not just being a jerk and being domineering and insensitive, right? So um, nice guys tend to be new agey in their thoughts about the world, the philosophy and approach uh, of spirituality, of going with the flow and saying yes to everything. And I find that that's really builds a resentment inside of them and builds walls and barriers to them actually getting what they really want in terms of like sexual success because they're being nice. They want to be liked. This is something I've dealt with in my own life. So I know I've come through it in my, my twenties, especially in 
teenage years especially, I wanted everyone to like me, right? I really cared about what everybody thought. I didn't want to do anything to give anybody any evidence to not like me, any reason to not like me, right? So I, I, I never stood up for myself. I never did, drew any line in the sand. Um, I never made waves. I went with the flow. I did what people asked me to do. I said yes to everything. And some people nowadays say, oh, it's a spiritual practice. I'll say yes to everything the universe offers me. And I say that's inauthentic. That's not actually defining yourself. And it's not letting other people know who you really are. So they, it's like if you have a dance partner and every time you lean in, they're not there. They disappear. Like you, you, there's nobody to lean into. Anyway, so there's this concept of nice ism and then there's this concept of being a jerk right two ends of the spectrum so good guys are learning to define themselves the perimeter of themselves what they stand for what they don't they'll say no and they'll mean it but they'll also consider things and say yes if they can really want to do it right so it's this embodying their own internal compass mm -hmm. they know what their north is Mm -hmm. and then can bring that to the table to other people. So it's no longer getting walked on, stepped all over. Um, it's learning how to stand up for yourself and have that kind of power of confidence to stand up for yourself and be sure of yourself. And, and it takes hardening your skin, getting a little tough, being able to take some punches, which isn't comfortable at all. And but, it's okay. Yeah. Like, I just wanted to say, like, it's okay Please. if people don't like you. I'll say like, it then. It's, it's, it's fucking okay for people to not <laughs> like you. Like, that's okay. Because the people who do like you are the ones that you want to spend time with. And the ones that don't like you because they don't resonate with you, not because you suck, not because you're bad, not because you're not good enough, but because we just don't gel, doesn't make it, doesn't make you bad, wrong, at all. And I, and I know that in my work, I spend a lot of time working with clients around this concept of it's okay to say no. And it's okay for other people to not be okay with that. It's okay for other people to not even like you. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes me think of allowing yourself permission to let other people deal with their responses deal with their shit stop trying to take care of their feelings and make everything soft and nice for them all the time you know if they're adults right if your children yes you want to take care of your child you got to help hand, help them handle their emotions you're, you're raising a new human being but you know with other adults yeah let them deal with their stuff and if you don't let them deal with their reactions what you're doing is you're fostering a dependency of them on you for them to handle the reality of their life and the connection with you. And that fostering codependency and enmeshment from another person is hindering their growth on their path. One thing I thought of recently, or was reminded of recently, as I was watching a video with somebody who was in their 80s or 90s, you know, somebody older, senior citizen, um, who is still learning new things about themselves, who is still investigating self-development and stuff like that and continuing to evolve. And, and so many of my friends in 20s and 30s and 40s kind of feel, they seem to me like they feel like they've got everything figured out and they've kind of um, solidified into a version of themselves. Like, like they learned to ride a bicycle and now that's all they do is ride a bicycle. They never go out and learn something new where they have to fall down. So they're not reinventing themselves. They, their evolution has kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's tragic. I'm like, well, I'm still alive. I want to keep evolving. I want to keep doing new things, finding out new aspects of myself, exploring new potentials and intelligences and, and play and explore in this amazing world that we live in because I'm alive, you know, because I'm not dead. Um, so, yeah. I want to bring it back to that concept of being the caretaker. Yeah. And, and that archetype has been so rooted for masculinity. And so that, inter, that, that codependency of being needed, being needed and being wanted and being desired, being all intermeshed with each other. 
Yeah. And that when we don't allow other, when we are so worried about everybody taking care of everybody and, and fixing the problem for everybody around us and resolving everything around us so that we are the go-to need, everybody needs us so that we feel a sense of worthiness and self. Worth. And worth. This, this sets up for some icky dynamics within yeah. your relationship. Not to mention it is not fucking sexy. <laughs> yeah. Because there's all sorts of resentment that ends up happening in that dynamic too. You have the person who's like, is always being falling apart and the, the other person who's rescuing them all the time. And there comes a period of time that you're like, you don't want to rescue that person. Like, get your shit together. And the person <laughs> who has, you've enabled them their whole entire life is resentful of you because resentful of the person who's always running to the rescue because they haven't learned any self care skill sets. And so there's like this huge dynamic that happens. And, I think stepping into that, letting go of that nice, I love that, like let go of the nice guy and just be the good guy. And the good guy is like steps up and says what he needs and what he wants and says no and lets people take responsibility for their own, their own shit and, and, and their own reactions and how they're going to deal. And, and, and that doesn't make you a jerk. I think that's really important is like saying no does not make you a jerk. Saying no with love and giving everybody else space around you to deal with whatever that comes up for them, that makes you a good guy. You know, it makes me think of this concept of having courage, of being bold. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to cockiness, mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, and confidence. Mm -hmm. And just to talk about heterosexual relationship dynamics in general stereotypical terms, because I find them useful as educational tools. Um, in general, women like men who are Oh no, you froze. Confident, who know themselves, know what they were. Hold on, you froze there for a second. Re-say re what you're gonna say. Okay, hold on a Oh, the tech, the tech gods. We Anything better? That's better, yeah. You got to come back into the frame, though. We only see your shoulder. Yeah. Okay. It's back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And go. I'm here. <laughs> like, there's just a lag. Okay. You got really excited. Well, you know about the heterosexual. I never said it, but um, I'm in, I'm in Costa Rica. Yeah. I know. I'll get back to it. But just to say, you know, since we had technical difficulties, I'm in Costa Rica. You know, and. It is uh, not as easy internet out here in the middle of the jungle as it is in North America. So I'm coming to you live from the jungle, even though you don't know it with my nice red background here. But yeah, it's the rainy season in the jungle right now. So sorry for the technical glitch, but I'm glad we're back up to speed. But um, yeah, so in, in just like regular stereotypical heterosexual relationship dynamics, um, it's true that women respond to men who are confident, who are cocky. And nice guys have this story that they perpetuate about how jerks are the one that get all the women. And, well, okay, I, it's true from a limited perspective, but if you zoom in on it and look at it in a bigger perspective, um, you'll see that it isn't actually that they want jerks. It's that they respond to men who are bold and clear and confident. Mm -hmm. And a little aggressive, a little dominant sometimes really goes a long way. You know, it, it gives a charge. Whereas if it's kind of a wishy-washy, everything's all good all the time, energy, there's no charge there. No. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the, and there's definitely the, from a primal standpoint, that sexual mm -hmm. response and sexual arousal comes from, comes from that confidence, that raw energy, right. that primal energy that, you know. There can be an energy of claiming, of, of claiming, taking, of taking, aggression, of, of desire. Aggression, of Making desire. the woman feel your desire. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's something that nice guys have been kind of trained by 
um, let me call it new age culture or feminist culture to suppress their desire for women because they think of it as objectifying is inherently evil. No, that. So on like general principles, they've kind of flushed out this intelligence that they could develop in their lives of being able to use their sexual and erotic energy in a relationship with a woman to demonstrate desire. But within the container. Yeah, you, hold on, you're and, gonna and what is better than to do but to also feel their respect for your for your boundaries. Yeah, and you need to say all of that all over again because we had a little tech diff tech issues oh i'm sorry we're having these little slowdowns um that's okay that's okay it's it's, it's the joy of li it's, it's the joy of you being in the jungle i got it i got it it's right, all good right. <laughs> it's like technology so how okay so come back to that place of talk when you started to drop into talking about the nice guys being basically washed out of that desire having their sexual power suppressed and washed out in this this era of um, not wanting to cause harm to women, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very noble and good thing. Yes to that, yes. definitely. Yes. But to suppress your sexual power dilutes the relationship terrain and muddies it. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you were to think of a terrain, like an epic vista, if you go to the Swiss Alps or something, the terrain is amazing. You want to look at it. You know, you don't want them washed out, muddy. There's nothing interesting there. It's just kind of sticky and yucky. Um, you want something that's epic with a huge panorama that with stunning contrast and, and diversity to it. So uh, the trick of it is is understanding that what we've done as a nice guy, I'm Captain Nice Guy right now, and what I do to... Um, Help the world is I, I I'm not a job day. I suppress myself and I get all wishy-washy and then I say oh well Why don't I get any of the women that I desire? They're all off of these jerks The trick of understanding that actually the dynamic still exists that women respond to confidence and and um, Honoring your boundaries, you know within a container of respect and boundaries if you can communicate your desire to somebody and have a little bit of that playfulness oh, there's nothing better no you know you're not pushing but yeah. you're being clear and yeah. then that that's like having a really good dance partner where you can yeah. demonstrate what you want to do and they're like oh i get this and they can lean back into you then you know where each other stands and then the dance can speed up and you can whip each other around and do these things that otherwise wouldn't be possible if you're always just kind of like doing the um dance that we did in junior high school oh <laughs> like this where there was no confidence yeah. there was no confidence whatsoever mm -hmm. you know everybody's so afraid of doing anything wrong that they just stayed in that wishy-washy nice person zone yeah. yeah well yeah and i spend a lot of time with my client my male clients come see me who are like super nice guys and they don't want to do anything wrong but because right. they don't want to do anything wrong they've lost their their mass that that primal sexual sexual empowerment like they've lost it, it it's it's like it's been contained and anytime it starts to come out in any way there's this fear that they're going to be predatory with it and so they suppress it again and it's and it's honorable like you said it's honorable that you you know that we've shifted this concept that we don't want to be predatory in, in abuse of way anymore fantastic woo, woo. but that doesn't mean that that primal lust is bad or wrong it's just learning how to move with it and dance with it in a new way and how to be able to you know you talked about respect and boundary setting and containment right it's like having conversations about this is really what I'd like to do to you and asking this is what I'd really like to do to you what do you think gives the space of it changes that that energy that you desire that partner your partner in that moment is not a bad thing and it's really fucking hot to have some guy whisper in your ear i want to you know throw you over you know i want to bend you over and fuck your brains out and make you scream like banshee right like it that's definitely it definitely can be 
it can and be incredibly a, hot. A, a person or a woman can be so locked up and so not far along on her, her pathway of erotic self evolution and development that that maybe no one's ever done that with her and that alone can feel like a violation right well and i think it's about how we set up the parameters right yes. but it's about how do we say hey like depending on right. what kind of relationship you have right is to say like okay what how can i express my desire to asking somebody how would you like me to express my desire for you that's a great question isn't it Mm, I like that question. Thank you okay. for giving me that and offering it here on Facebook because that is a powerful question. Yeah. Let's just, would you, let's just say that again. Okay. How would you like me, to, I express, me to express my desire for you? Yeah. Ooh, I got Train me. Saying that. Help, yeah. me you know, help me out here. Let, it's it's, it's uh, a, a way I've heard this referred to is showing somebody how to win with you. Yeah. If we show each other how to win. If you want to win with me, you need to know some things about me. Now, if I yeah. give you that information, I help you to win with me. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you could say like, like one really useful piece of information that I like to teach people when I'm teaching them how to have a safer sex conversation in five minutes or less is what words do you like to use to refer to your genitals? Yeah. Cause if you hate the word cunt, hate it, and I use it and I'm thinking I'm being bold and leaning in and being <laughs> desirous. And I use that word and it's the wrong word for you. I mess it all up. Oh, it's true. And it's an honest mistake and no one's yeah. at fault, but it messes things up. And then you've got to recover territory yeah. ground that you lost. So, so yeah, how to win with me. Yeah. You know, you're, you're saying, how, how, how can I win with you? I would like to express desire for you, but I want to do that in a way that is going to feel good to you and respectful to you. You know, how can I do that? Yeah. And I love that because then yeah. I get the opportunity to say exactly how I would like that to happen. The other person gets this beautiful gift of not being like, oh, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to do the wrong thing? Oh my God, the stress, the stress, the stress, you know? And then of course the penis <laughs> is like, Wah. yeah, yeah. Not and showing up for the party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, oh my God, this is too stressful. Like, how do I lean into her? What do I do with her? I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. so it changes all of that as well as it also gives the male in that situation permission to say the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right, because it's not just, and I, and I really need to say this for all the ladies that are going to listen to this episode, okay? All you heterosexual women, or anybody who's having sex with men, yeah. <laughs> right? It's really important. It's not their job to seduce us. It's not their responsibility to seduce us. It's our responsibilities to co-seduce each other and co-create that sexy space for each other. And I need to say that because in this archetype, this old archetype of expecting men to seduce us and then yep. at the same time being offended when they do because they don't do it right. Oh, it's God. Like, you're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. If you don't, right? You're rocking and a that, hard place no, and nobody gets any satisfaction. Just, and then we exactly. stay stuck in dissatisfaction in our lives and we say, why? And then we throw up our hands in frustration and exhaustion and we go, Nobody can figure this out. And we go, you know, do some addictive behavior yeah. to make ourselves feel better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, it's such, such a lovely thing that you just said about to, to work with women to help them embrace the concept of flipping that script and claiming their sexual power. And, you know, it's one of the most common fantasies that men communicate to me that I've ever seen ever is that maybe it's number one that the men fantasize about a woman who is controlling, who will take charge and climb on top of him and push him down and F his brains out. Like it is one of the most common fantasies that men have is a confident woman who, who overcomes him. Now it's also one of the most common fantasies for a woman is a confident man who will put her, her down and take her in the way that the man wants. So we both have this. Maybe everybody has this. Um, so flipping that script and saying, okay, let's lean into giving ourselves permission to try out being more aggressive, to try out being more dominant, to being more open and, um, dare I say, promiscuous 
let's reclaim the word promiscuous and remove it from being something shameful and say just being more outgoing more sexually wanting playful and, des and desiring more exploratory right. Yeah. right yeah um anyway you know so yeah i love i love flipping that script and you know i don't i'm not a dating coach i don't coach men on dating I've seen so many dating coaches and I just think it's they're teaching sleazy tools of manipulation and I hate it. I don't want to, to facilitate men going and making conquests. That, that just sounds horrible to me. I'm in a long-term relationship and that's what I find to be the juiciest thing is getting to go deeper and deeper and deeper and to continue to evolve on my path of evolution as an individual single human being. And, my, and be there maybe in a parallel path with, with my partner who's continuing to evolve on her path separately. And, and, but as the years go by and you get to know each other better and deeper and you go through life's experiences and the hard times, the sense of profound love that develops is so strong. And I want that for people. I want people to experience the strength of love and passion that can grow from continuing to be in successful relationship with somebody long term, that to me is the juiciest thing. Mm -hmm. Sure, of you know, a one night stand or sex clubs can be really satisfying and very useful sexually, but that's just not what I teach. There's other people that do that. I help people succeed in relationships long term, or get their energy set at a good frequency so that maybe so that they, they can, can get that long term relationship. Yeah. You know. And that's one of the areas that I do a lot of teaching. I mean, as a holistic sexual wellness specialist, I drop into mm -hmm. very much all the different ways in which people can show up on and have sexual relationships and what that looks like, whether that's monogamy, conscious monogamy, ethical non-monogamy, you know, the whole gamut of those human experiences and those sexual experiences. But from that place of honor and authentic like being ethical in it and authentic in it, like your empowerment of who you are and being able to easily say yes, but just as easily say no. Actually, no is more important. Learning how to say no and stepping into that and owning your no and not being apologetic for your no is actually the key to being a sexual, liberated and free being, period. Yeah, you know, it's such a powerful... A thing to learn how to say no and we never we never we don't we aren't taught it as children we're taught to say yes to our parents we're taught to say yes to any uh adult figure right we're just taught to say yes do what we're told not make waves go with the flow and then we honestly it takes it's a it's a rare person who's brought up with parents who train their child to have a strong no um so here, the majority of us have a, as adults have to deprogram this construct, this app that was installed in our operating system here and, and learn how to claim our no. Mm -hmm. And the most powerful work I've done in that is with non-sexual touch mm -hmm. in cuddle parties, which make people go, what? What's a cuddle party? That sounds weird. Why would I go cuddle with strangers? And I totally get it. Why the hell would I go cuddle with strangers? <laughs> Let's ask that question. Maybe you don't want to. And that is the point <laughs> that you can go to an event like this, which is basically a boundaries workshop Shop. from a self-empowerment perspective, yeah. how to have boundaries for what I'll say yes to and yeah. what I won't. And to go there and even practice just saying no to every invitation that you get and say, no, I'm just practicing saying no and not making it mean anything, not trying to take care of your feelings because I don't want to do that thing that you're asking me to do. Yeah. Um, and for some people, it's the first time they've ever actually said no. And one of the things that we teach in that is giving yourself permission to change your mind right now or five minutes from now or five hours from now or five days from now. It's all right to change your mind. You can do it. Yeah. You don't have to do this Hollywood based character trait of sticking with it till the bitter end because I gave my word. That's inauthentic. 
It's, it's like, it, what do I feel? In you're this not signing place? a contract, you you're know, when, contract. when you're like <laughs> flirting with somebody. That is not a contract. You're not signing anything. You can change your mind. It's all right to get up in the middle of the date, put down your fork and say, you know, I thought this was great, but I changed my mind. I'm going home now. And just yeah. let the person handle their feelings. Yeah. They might need some support to handle their feelings, but that's not your responsibility. <laughs> responsibility. You yeah. need to handle your feelings, your feelings and take care of yourself and probably go home and like, you know, whatever you're going to do, take a bath, you know, do some self care. But I think that I love how it, we, we, we come back to that no compete piece because that's that difference between being the nice guy versus being the conscious cock is that being able to really sit in your no, to own your no, to own so that when you say yes, you really mean yes. You know, you're really excited about the yes because you can say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just because, uh, just because somebody has offered you something, you don't need to be polite and say yes if you don't really want it. doesn't matter what it is. We're across the board. Whether it's a piece of cake, or some pussy. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's really useful in the realm of sexuality, but it applies to all areas of our it life. Does. I see it with my son. He's just six years old. And, you know, he'll ask me, hey, dad, do you want to play tag? Hey, dad, do you want to go throw frisbee? And, I, you know, when he asks me, oftentimes I'll just say, no, no, I don't. I just don't. And what the effect of that is that over the years now that I've been training him in being able to handle me taking, saying a no clearly and not making it mean anything, that now when I do say yes, he knows I mean it. Mm -hmm. And he knows I'm going to be 100% present with him. And he, you'll see him. He's just jumping for joy. He's running around the house. Yay, dad said yes. And then we have the best time. You know, so having your strong no empowers your yes because people know you really mean it. Yeah. Because if you can't say no, then how can they ever trust your yes? It's just a watered down yes. You just go along with everything anyway. You're just a wishy-washy wet rag, right? But if you can say a strong no, they can trust when you say yes. You really mean it. Yeah. And I also believe that when we don't actually say no, we still say no in many ways that is not honorable. So we say yes to things. And we get, we, we make an excuse. We don't show up. We don't, we are passive aggressive. We, we uh -huh. still, the, okay. now the, I understand. Things, the things that we don't want to do, we in the end will not actually do. Right. But we, we, will come, yeah. we will, we will, we will, uh, we will come all, all sorts of reasons why we don't actually have to follow through on that. Yes. Yeah. Without taking responsibility, responsibility and actually taking the no. No. Yeah. Right. Which yeah, is we what shirk I the see, responsibility uh, and get out of the activity. Yeah. yeah, but we don't risk the saying no of what the reaction of that person is going to be. It's almost like it's better to have somebody angry at you for not being reliable and not following through on stuff, and is it's it's almost easier that than it is for the fact that if you say no and you're going to consciously disappoint somebody. Even though you're really disappointing that person by not following through on whatever it is that you said yes to, it's almost like that is less painful or less scary than just somebody, when you say no and somebody reacting, the fear of what that reaction is going to be. Yeah, right. Yeah, of dealing with the harsh reality of the blazing sun. And you can't get away from it. Just dealing with the sun shining down in all of its power. It's so much easier to put up clouds and obstructions and, you know, dodge yeah. the issue. And I also want to have compassion that there's lots of situations where it's healthy and, and useful to keep these things in between and to keep playing the part, not coming out of the closet maybe yet because it's not the right time or you're not in a safe place. You know, we, it's useful to talk about safety also. Like yes. I, I, I am very excited to talk about self-empowerment and I also sometimes listen to people talking about self-empowerment and saying, you know, that's really a privileged thing that you're saying right there. And there's lots of people that are in places and situations, relationships that are dangerous or unhealthy or abusive, and they don't have the tools to be able to do what we're talking about because, because we're in safe places. You yes. know, we're not, I'm not being threatened. No, um, so I, I have a, so much compassion. Abusive, yeah. You're not in an abusive situation. And I think that's important. I love that you brought that up because it's really important that if anybody who's listening is like, well, that must be nice. I think it's right. really important 
that you do what's in your best interest, which will yeah. keep you safe. Right. And if you can figure out how to get out of that circumstances and that situation with some extra support, um, you know, kudos. But it's also important that your safety is number one. And it may not be safe to turn to your partner who is physically abusive. Oh and my God, no. no. Right? Yeah. 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 So, so just to acknowledge that it, it is a privileged thing to be able to say no yeah. and that a lot of people are not in a place to actually be able to do that without harm coming to them mm -hmm. and to have compassion for that as we're spewing all these tools that are really great to the people that can reach for them and grab them. But there's a lot of people who can't reach for them and grab them. And I have just have compassion and space for that and not be talking all dogmatic about, Oh, you should do this and Oh, you should do this. And then you'll be an enlightened being. You're like, well, you know, we're all on an evolution. We're all on a staircase taking one step at a time when we can. And some of us maybe are so empowered that we can do this stuff. We have all of our basic needs met so we can think about nuances in our minds of relationships and stuff like that. And what a wonderful world to be able to play in. Mm -hmm. And the good thing to do with all that privilege is to offer a helping hand to anybody else and say, come on up. And that's one of the things that I think about in my work with, with Conscious Cock, writing my book and stuff like that is like, oh my God, I have a voice and I'm able to speak clearly with you right now on Facebook. And yeah. that's an amazing, powerful thing. And not everybody can do that. No. A lot of people can't. A lot of people would be, would be hurt, would be ostracized, could be killed, whatever. And to say, okay, well, what are we going to do with our privilege, but help other people use our privilege to do good, help them to find their voice, to find their place of empowerment so they can make better choices for themselves. Yes. So I'm so glad that you do this work that you do and that yeah. I do this work, you know, and for, for every one of us that can span, stand up and speak clearly, there's millions that can't. Yeah. That might look to us and say, thank you for doing it. You're kind of lighting the way in, in the darkness here because there's so few role models standing up for this concept of personal liberation that is sex positive. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's and so valuable. It's so valuable. So I'd like to give everybody a, a quick little exercise to start the process. If you're like, okay, you two keep saying this word no and standing up for yourselves and blah, blah, great. blah, and all that stuff. And that's so great. And, you know, I'm so glad that you guys know how to say no, blah, blah, blah. And the concept of saying no is like, ah, inside you. <laughs> you're like, fuck you, guy. Fuck you, Christopher. <laughs> I want to give you a nice, easy step is that I want you, wherever you feel that you are capable to lean into, that it's going to not be life or death, the reaction's not going to be huge, I want you to say no at least once a day. Things like, would you like to up sell your hamburger <laughs> at the drive-thru? No right? You saying no is not the end of the world. You know, when someone says, asks you if blah, 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 you're like, no, I want you to find at least one thing in your day that you can kind of tease and test that. What does it feel like to be able to just say no and not apologize or make excuses for it? Like I'd like to piggyback on that yeah. and, and piggyback and say that it's really a juicy exercise to practice saying no to a parent no well, matter you, what age we are you went like you, hot, say, you went, you went way forward <laughs> it's okay no i'm 45 no listen to me let me just piggyback on it for a moment i'm 45 you know my mom's 65 whatever and even at my age let's say i'm over for thanksgiving dinner we're talking a little bite-sized piece here okay yeah. and she always wants to pile on the yams with marshmallows on top. Just to say, I give myself permission that next time that happens, I'm gonna say no. Hmm. No thanks, I don't want that. And just leave it. Hmm. You know, it's, it's a, it might seem like I can't ever say no to her, but giving myself permission, planning ahead. Oh, I know she always does that thing that I don't like, but it's a small thing. I think I can manage saying no to that. And then start defining the uh, boundary you know, with, with a parent or caregiver or somebody like a boss, 
you know, something small is not going to really make a difference, but you keep saying yes to it. And every time you say yes, you feel bad inside your, your heart, like beats a bit, you feel tension in your stomach. You feel like this icky feeling like, you know, you had you have a visceral experience in your body to use that intelligence that you're hearing, your internal guidance and intuition to pay attention to it. Say, oh, okay. There's that thing again. This is that thing that I, I could say no to. Maybe next time I'll give myself permission to say no to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, that being said, there's a dynamic that's going to exist. So that we, and I, I just want to, I just want to say that, that you may, if the dynamic of saying no to the yams, for example, and now you're going to say no, which is awesome, but you have to be prepared that it's like, oh no, it's okay. You, you, you have to be prepared that your no will not be respected. And I think that's an important piece of the puzzle <laughs> that, that you go in with, right? Is that it's not so much about your no being respected, especially first time out, right? It's just okay. about you saying the no. Having said it at all. Said it at all. Yep. Because I think if we get attached to the person respecting the no, it's like, well, see, this is why I don't say no. I don't say no because now there's a drama and now there's a thing and it doesn't get respected and my voice isn't heard and blah, blah, blah. And the, the, all of that story uh -huh. that, that, that's going to be played out, right? Is that if you're going to say no, you just say no for the sake of saying no. And then you can work on the next phase of that, which is how do we set boundaries and have people respect them? <laughs> that's like phase two of that adventure because- right. The truth is, is that how other people respond to us, we can't control. Right, right. And if we are attached to that outcome of how they're going to respond, it influences how we respond. You know, just practicing getting those words out of our out. mouth. Yeah. Out. Rather than inside where I experience it is like this kind of um, heart racing high blood pressure thing that's how i personally experience it in my body like oh there's something i want to say I, i'm getting this i want to say it getting it out of my mouth no i don't want the yams or no yeah. thank you at least is the first step exactly oh and if we can develop that ability to yeah. translate that internal body message of for example tight feeling in my gut fast heart rate and translate that into actually saying the thing that we feel in our minds we should say that's the first step. And we, we can become, we can develop, develop that like a muscle that we're building. The ability to state that thing that we, we know we should say because we feel it in our body like a apprehension or something like that. Um, and the more you work that muscle, the easier oh, it gets. Easy. Until it's eventually, easy. it's really strong and it's fluent and it's just the way you operate in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Where you can be like, no, 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 no. no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bring it. No, yeah. no, no, right? And that's, and I think that's a big piece of also shifting that from that caretaker component, right? Allowing other people to have their stuff. Okay, so let's wrap it up a little bit here. Okay. So, what would you say is the thing that you want to leave the audience with that this concept of conscious cock living? <laughs> what do you? What do you want to give them? What do you want them to, to like take away? Like the big takeaway from our conversations today? Well, you know, the main focus of my work is, is with men, heterosexual men. And by extension, their couple, their partner. All right. So couples that are, are together. But, you know, my main focus is empowering men because I've gone through my journey of self-empowerment as a man. Um, and I have a lot of tools to offer from my wisdom and experiences over the years. And I've gone from being completely sexually repressed, doing what everybody thought I should do, rather than what I thought I should do, to finding my own mission in life, my authentic frequency of vibration, my mission and vision in this life. So I have a purpose and I know because it's mine because I uncovered it. And having a purpose is like the single biggest catalyst that I've seen for men to help them unfold into their power, knowing what their reason for being here on this planet in this life is. Um, and from that, so much power comes. So uh, to men and by extension, 
their partner, if they're in a couple relationship, I would, I would say, um, giving space and time and having a system and a structure to help support you in finding out what you really want in life is the deepest foundational cornerstone building block that you can make to your, your empowerment in your life, your sexual empowerment in your life, but also your professional and economic and relationship empowerment in your life. And not knowing what is really you and what you really want, it dilutes everything and uh, takes your power away. So I work with, with men in men's circles because it's the best educational format that I've found. So many guys are resistant to going into a class where there's a teacher on this level and everybody's a student down here or guru and disciple, this power differential. But in a circle format where I lead men's circles online or here in Costa Rica, everybody's on a level playing field. I and mean, as we share our experiences and I facilitate the circle, inevitably we're learning from what this guy's saying and identifying with it. We're learning from what this guy's saying and we leave so much richer having learned from everybody, but also getting to share our own gifts. And then that creates interconnectedness, which builds a sense of support uh, and encouragement because guys feel, so many guys feel alone, like a lone light hanging out in the, in the desert. Anybody else around here? Any other good guys trying to rise and make the world a better place? And they feel so alienated. There's no solidarity. But in the circle format, um, it creates these relationships and community which give guys encouragement. When you make a win, when you, when you have a success, there's guys to say, yeah, you did good and pat you on the back. Keep going. And hey, did you think about trying it this way maybe next time? You know, so building this sense of community and support is so important to helping a guy rise into a better version of himself that he wants to become. Doing it alone, like I did it, 20 years of just working on it alone is so hard. Being a light out in the desert is so hard. And so I'm shortening that gap, giving the guys the shortcut. You know, that's the reason for my book is like, okay, here's like a 101 level conscious relationship, conscious sexuality manual um, to help you just totally have a big boost and level up with simple, easy to learn tools that you don't have to learn how to meditate 20 minutes a day for 10 years to, to master, you know, like you'll get my concept in five minutes and then it'll pay you benefits for the rest of your life. So let me summarize this all to say, guys, knowing what your mission in life is, or at least hunting for that, being on the hunt for your mission and vision, and then being in, in a place of support with other men to pat you on the back and support you and help you, it's the best thing, best thing that you can do. Um, and women that I know have said to me, I only date men that are in men's circles. I only date men that have other men friends that are good human beings. You know, there's so many men out there nowadays that don't have any friends except their, their girlfriend or their wife. They're like that's, that's enmeshment. That's codependence. That's not em empowerment. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. All right. How do they get more of you? All right. Well, the simple way is to buy my book. This and is version. Call, because remember there's audio. This is all audio. Yep. Right. Is the, my book, Conscious Cock, the first edition I self-published on Amazon. It's available right now. Uh, the second edition is getting published by Moons Grove Press out of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm very excited. Uh, so clinical sexologist Gloria Brame picked it up and is publishing it. Um, so that'll be coming out on audible.com as an audio book that you can listen to in your cell phone with headsets or in your car while you're driving <laughs> to work um, or as a Kindle um, ebook. Uh, yep. or as paperback. So that's coming out in the next couple months. Um, and you can also go to my website, ConsciousCock.com, and I do uh, coaching for men and women and couples one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And then I also have this group co coaching format where we meet online with a group Zoom call once a week, uh, which is a more affordable price point for, for people and gives us this sense of community and solidarity. So ConsciousCock.com has everything on it. You can get in touch with me. You can read more about me. I've got tons of free downloads, worksheets about like how to come up with a script to say something that you really need to say to your partner, but you don't know how to bring it up. Maybe it's a sexual desire, or maybe it's something that you did that you're ashamed of that you need to clear the air about, but the script is the same. Um, or how to make agreements in your relationship. 
maybe you don't have agreements and that's kind of muddying the waters for you. There's lots of worksheet downloads that you can do to help improve your relationship in five minutes. And awesome. it's all on consciouscock.com. So uh, yeah. all of those will be in the show notes, all the links, how to get a hold of Christopher, how to spend more time with Christopher. Hmm. I want to say for everybody who is hung out with us and listened to us, first of all, congratulations for taking the time to, to hang out and learn and hope, hope you found us incredibly entertaining and uh, you take something juicy away from this conversation. And I want to say to all the men, I lovingly give you permission to own who you are and who you are and your primal desires. So I give you permission and go explore what that looks like from a place of honoring the people around you and moving with that in a new way. So you can find me at succulentliving.com and you can follow me on all the social media places at Guy Morissette. That's it. That's all. Mwah! <laughs> all right, hold on here. Substream.